ஸ்ரீ குருபியோ நமக ஹரி ஓம் ஆச்சாரிய பவனோஸ்வாக்கம் ஆச்சாரியாணி ச பாரதி தேவோ நாராயண ஸ்ரீஷக தேவி மங்கள தேவதா வெல்கம் டு ஆல் ஆஃப் யூ ஃபார் தி வியாசராஜ ஆராதகா செலிப்ரேஷன்ஸ் இன் தி இயர் ட்வெண்ட்டி ட்வெண்ட்டி ஒன் மை நேம் இஸ் சுந்தர் மடக்ஷிரா ஐ எம் ஃப்ரம் இந்தியா ஐ ஸ்டே இன் பெங்களூர் இட்ஸ் பீன் மை ப்ரிவிலேஜ் தட் ஃபார் த லாஸ்ட் தேர்ட்டி இயர்ஸ் I've had the benefit of learning Madhva Shastra uh, from various scholars, especially Dr. Yasin Kere Prabhanjana Acharya and Dr. Shrikant Achar Bayari. And over the years, I've had the opportunity to listen to several Pravachanas and read books about our illustrious Gurus. Today, I'm so happy to be sharing few nuggets about Sri Vyasa Raja's very, very illustrious life. Sri Vyasa Raja comes from a great lineage which was started by Sri Madhva Acharya. Subsequent to that, there were several scholars, several pontiffs and saints who have enriched the Madhva Shastra over the years. They used every opportunity to represent the Shastras, getting into specific areas of details. which were available in the Sarva Moola Granthas or the Granthas, the 37 texts that Sri Madhva Acharya had actually propounded. And from time to time, they addressed several questions, several debates, several doubts, several anxieties in the philosophical world through their own contribution. And in this great lineage, three people are often recounted for their fantastic contribution. that is Sri Madhva Acharya himself, Sri Jaitirtha and Sri Vyasa Raja. It is said in a very famous shloka that Sri Madhva Kalpa Vrikshastu Jayariyaha Kamadhrik Smrataha Chintamanishtu Vyasariyaha Munitrayam Udahritam. So these three people are called Munitrayas or the three saints who are in many ways the cornerstone of the Dvaita philosophy as we look at it right now. Sri Madhva Acharya is known as a Bhashyakara because he gave us the fantastic commentary on Brahma Sutras and 36 more texts which talked about different topics of the philosophical world. Subsequent to him, Sri Jayatirtha, also known as the Tika Kritpadaru, has propounded many texts which are known as Tika Granthas, which are basically appreciative critiques on Sri Madhva Acharya's works. and also addressing several questions which were raised on Sri Madhva Acharya's work. Sri Madhva Acharya's work, for those of you who are familiar, are very, very pithy. They are very short and what we, in the modern day world, we call it bullet point presentation. Now the bullet point is a great way of presentation to somebody who is familiar with the context. But to ensure that this actually reaches the common man, Sri Jaitirtha, through his Tika Granthas, has supported, has englemished and also simplified many, many parts of what Sri Madhva Acharya's initial purport was. And Sri Vyasa Raja himself talks about these two people in a beautiful shloka which says, Ananda Tirthopadishto Nidhir Narayana Payaha Pradashayena Samyak Jaitirtham Tamashe. He says Madhva Acharya talked about Narayana as a nidhi or the great wealth, but it was up to Jaitirtha to open the box, the treasure trove that was there, and show us the greatness of what Sri Madhva Acharya has actually propounded. What a beautiful way of talking about Sri Madhva Acharya and Sri Jaitirtha. In that lineage came the third saint. that is Sri Vyasa Raja. There have been many people who have made fantastic contributions to the Madhva philosophy. But when, when we look back, the contribution of Sri Vyasa Raja has been something which falls in the category of the rarest of the rare. A great scholar, a great poet, someone who knew the language, the tarka, and every aspect of philosophy absolutely to the core. and someone who at a very, very young age became a symbol of knowledge 
in the philosophical world in those days. So this is the Munitraya that we are talking about. Now when we look at the story of Sri Vyasaraja, we see that his life had been captured beautifully by Vyasa, by a person by name Somanatha Kavi in a text called Vyasa Yoga Charita or something that can be called about like a biography. Unfortunately today, that remains today as one of the few texts which gives us the complete history of Sri Vyasaraja. Even that text is not available in completeness. So we are in many ways decapacitated to reconstruct his life. But whatever we have, we are very sure about his authenticity. Because as many of you would know, that whatever he did or whatever he propounded was in the city of Hampi, which was the capital of the Vijayanagara kingdom. And Hampi today, every archaeological survey is now digging up more details about Vijayanagara Samrajya as well as what Sri Vyasaraja did in that particular city towards the end of his life. So what is this childhood like? Sri Vyasaraja was born in a city called Bannur, which is on the way between Bangalore and Mysore. It is a small village and his parents, Sri Ramacharya and Sri Lakshmi Bai. The Vyasa, Yogira, Vyasa Yogi Charita recounts them with their names. But there is a very interesting story behind his birth. His parents were actually very aged and they did not have children. So once the, the couple, the elderly couple decided to go on a yatra to Badrinath and on their way, whom should they find? They found Sri Brahmanatirtha who was a great pontiff, a great scholar, a very very established guru who had just visited Badrinath and was on his way back to the southern part of India. The couple were staying at one place but all of a sudden Sri Ramacharya was struck by a disease which almost proved fatal. So Lakshmi Bhai in sheer desperation went and met Sri Brahmanatirtha. What a divine coincidence this is. This is what they say in our scriptures. That God gives us the problems but he also gives us the solutions. And when you see a great guru or a Brahman coming to you. Please treat that as a great sign and something that the a message that God is giving you on how you should be overcoming the present day challenges or the challenges we are facing at that time. So exactly this happened to the couple and the lady went and spoke to Sri Brahmanitirtharu, fell at his feet and asked him for directions about what she should do. As those days it was very common for if the, the husband died, the woman would also die or commit suicide in, by jumping into the funeral pyre or some other manner. It was called Sahagamana. And she asked Sri Brahmanitirtharu for permission. And what should Sri Brahmanitirtha say? He told her that I bless you and I bless your husband with a long life. And not only that, he says, Suputravati Bhava, that means may you be blessed with a child. The, the woman was completely astonished. Not only was she delighted to know that the Guru has blessed her and a husband with a long life, but also blessed her, blessed them that they have a child. And the woman very intrigued, of course very happy but intrigued. She asked Sri Brahmanatirtharu, that how can this happen? We are very aged and we, my husband is almost on a deathbed. To which Brahmanatirtha said that if I am saying it, it is not my voice. It is indeed God's voice which is giving you this blessing. So don't worry, your husband will survive and you will have a child. But you will have to hand over that child to me. And I will make him a disciple, a scholar and somebody that the whole world is very proud of. So that is the story of the parents meeting Sri Brahmanatirtha. Soon after that, the parents, the couple came back to Manur and they were staying there when the child was born. 
the child did had no goose parsha as per brahmana tirtha's instruction so what does it mean that as soon as the child was born the child was delivered on a golden plate chinna the harimana as they they call it and the child was born in that it was put inside that and no goose parsha now why do we say why is this needed because parsha of the bhumi of the earth means a child will always have earthly ambitions ambitions to do with this world and nothing beyond but the child there was indeed someone very very special and not one to be entrapped by these world's limitations and constraints the child was indeed divine and the child was none other than someone who will become the vyasa raja in the future so the, child, the the couple kept their word and handed over the child to the brahmana tirtha now the brahmana tirtha was a saint leading a very strict life of his own and he brought up the child with all the love and affection that he could give to the child imagine a saint who had so many constraints a very very dis- strict and disciplined life where everything ha- has to happen by the minute and living a spiritual life devoid of many many materialistic possessions bringing up a child a new born child and he did that and it is said that he not only he brought up the child and so much so today there is a uh, symbol of that available near the place called abur which is again between bangalore and mysore in a small detour from the town of chennapatna there is a place called abur which is where sri brahmana tirtha samadhi or his vrindavana exists even today a little away the the river flows and he used to give a bath to the child every day and that place is called shweta shila and it exists even today so brahmana tirtha brought up the child with all the affection and all the care the child grew up to be a wonderful boy and at a very young age of 5 years the thread ceremony or upanayanam was performed now this again calls for a very special yoga as all of us know brahmin boys go through the sacred thread ceremony or the upanayana upanayana means actually opening your inner eye the spiritual eye so that ceremony after which somebody is eligible to study the vedas is called upanayana and the child the the, the ceremony was performed and the child Uh, started to study the vedas under the tutelage of shri brahmana tirtha soon at a very young age of just 8 years the child was ordained the sanyasa or monkhood and that and was named shri vyasa vyasa tirtha the child would soon emerge as a great scholar a person of unprecedented intellect and someone who would rule the spiritual and the philosophical world for a very long time so once as one dates the birth of shri vyasa raja it happened in the year 1440 1447 he lived 92 years in this world and made stellar contribution to the world of philosophy to the world of administration and the world of righteousness as such of course this is the childhood of shri vyasa raj the next important stage of shri vyasa raj's life actually happens in a place called mulabagalu mulabagalu as some of you would know is a small town which happens to be between bangalore and tirupati so as one travels to, from bangalore to tirupati you you will go into a town called mulabagalu the town of mulabagalu which is a small town now happened to be an education center for many centuries before shri vyasa raja actually came there since the time of shri akshobha tirtha so akshobha tirtha took the angara or the sacred coal and drew a symbol of shri narasimha on a rock and slowly and steadily shri narasimha's picture actually emerge very clearly from that rock so those of you who have visited will agree with me that over the years 
this picture is becoming only clearer and clearer. This was also the place that he defeated the Advaiti scholar Vidyaranya in a fierce debate. And to this day exists a beautiful pillar as a symbol of this victory very close to Mudabaglu. So over the years this had developed into a major so center of learning of the scriptures and the Shastras. And had the great Sripada Raja now presiding over that particular university which was there in Mulabagri. So Sri Brahmanatirtha then deputed Sri Vyasa Raja and told him that you, he needs to go to Mulubagilu for his higher studies. So you can think of something like sending a child to uh, for you know postgraduate studies to a higher center of learning. Vyasa Raja of course obeyed his, his guru and he started to walk towards, uh, towards Mulubagilu. On the way he toured several places and reached Mulubagilu. But before that he he went into a lot of series of debates with great scholars and defeated them in that dis in those discussions. So imagine Sri Sri Padaraja's dilemma when he heard that he he has to now teach a student who was a scholar of the highest order, defeating not just individual scholars but defeating several people who had come in groups to defeat him. So much so that unable to tolerate Sri Vyasaraja's great scholarliness and scholarship, they actually tried to even kill him by trying to poison him. Sri Vyasaraja, again, someone who knew exactly how to counter this, started meditating on Dhanvantri, the Dhanvantri Japa. He did that endlessly for a long time before all the poison in his body just vanished. And not only did he not die, but also clear, clear, sent a clear message to everyone. That those of us who for some reason are sick or unwell need to do the Dhanvantri Japa in order to get good health. And he proved that by showing an example about how he himself could overcome the poisoning attempt that was made on him. So, Sri Padaraja then began to contemplate how am I going to teach the student who has got this kind of a scholarship. And he meditated on Mukhya Prana Devaru or Hanuman. And Sri Madhvacharya came in his dreams and instructed him that not to worry, you have the scholarship and I will help you to train Sri Vyasaraja. Don't forget that in that Vyasaraja, you have someone who is going to be someone who is going to take forward the Madhva Mata further after you for many, many more centuries. So yes, that happened. Sri Sri Padaraja then started to teach Sri uh, Vyasaraja. And Vyasaraja with a superb intellect, absolute commitment and great intellectual prowess soon became a master of the Madhva philosophy. Imagine he studied for so many years after having studied under a scholar like Brahmanatirtha. So you can see how great Brahmanatirtha was in ensuring that he, does, he gives his student a higher level of learning under Sri Padaraja, again a scholar like Sri Padaraja who had, who could teach a person like Sri Vyasaraja who was already an expert even before he entered the, 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 his school and Sri Vyasaraja himself who put in enormous amount of hard work, meditation and earned the grace of God and his gurus to become a name to reckon with and whom we are recollecting several centuries after his Vrindavana Pravesha. So he studied for many many years and finally a, a unique incident happened in Tirupati. Tirupati as we know is one of the greatest pilgrimages in India and had the temple there has been was under the, the control and the administration of, uh, of, the, of the kings who were, uh, who were kings of Chandragiri. So a bizarre incident happened. All of us know the Brahmotsava 
is celebrated every year in Tirupati where Lord Venkateshwara along with his consorts is taken around the temple on, on Vahanas like the Hanumad Vahana, Garuda Vahana, Shesha Vahana and so on. So once the king went up the hill to actually visit the temple and what did he saw, see there? That the priests over there had picked up their own children and their own kids and, and kept them on the Vahana and they were taking them on a joy ride. The, the king in a fit of anger just killed the entire family which had been ordained to perform the puja of the Venkateshwara on the Tirupala hills. A bizarre incident indeed. But after he finished off the whole family, he became repentant that, oh my God, I have done Brahmahatya or killing of these Brahmin priests and how will, how will I be able to overcome these sins? and wash them away. And he had a second bigger problem which was who will now perform the puja at Tirumala temple. And then he ran to Mulubagilu and fell at the feet of Sri Sri Padaraja and said, O oh Guru, you have to help me. You have to ensure that the sins that I have go away and please guide me on who will perform the puja at Tirumala. Shri Raja, the great saint that he was and the mystical powers that he had, had solutions and immediate solutions to both of them, both the problems that the king actually put in front of him. He said, I will sprinkle on you the prokshana of the Shankhodaka. It's a sacred water which one gets after doing the puja in the conch shell or shankha. And he sprayed that, sprinkled that on on the king and immediately he was uh, all the Brahmahatya dosha that he had went away. And to the second question about who will pray and who will perform the puja in the Tirupati temple, Sri Sri Padaraja deputed none other than Sri Vyasaraja himself to go and perform the puja in the, in the Tirupati temple. So for 12 long years, Sri Vyasaraja was the overall administrator as well as performed all the pujas at, at Tirupati. Even today, the Tirumala Tirupati Devasthana has got several places which are dedicated to the memory of Sri Vyasaraja. The most famous being a small place, it's called Sri Vyasaraja Anhika Mantapa. Those of you who have gone to Tirupati would know that there is a beautiful pond called Sri Swami Pushkarni just on the banks of the temple and that particular pond has a small place where Sri Vyasaraja used to sit and perform all his uh, Dainandina Anika that means all the rituals that he has to perform every single day. That small place exists even today and it is protected by a small uh, building that has been built around that. So if you go to Tirupati, please do visit this place. It is right next to Sri Varaha Swami temple which is on the banks again of Sri Swami Pushkar. So Sri Vyasaraja then performed that puja. He did, he also was responsible for the administration of the temple. It is said that many things that, that, that we see in the Tirupati temple in terms of administration, in terms of structuring, in terms of organization structures, etc. were all propounded by Sri Vyasaraja at that point in time. So this is the story of Sri Vyasaraja at Tirupati. The next stage of his life actually happened in the Vijayanagara Samrajya. As we know, one of the greatest kings of the Vijayanagara Samrajya was Sri Krishna Devaraya himself. And he invited Sri Vyasaraja after his designated 12 years of puja were complete in Tirupati. So let's go back to the story. When the king killed all the people of the family which was performing the puja, one of the women there was pregnant with a child and the child was born soon. A young boy was born and Sri Vyasaraja waited 
for 12 years to teach him how the, the puja has to be performed and after 12 years hand it back the temple administration as well as the puja paddhati to the family to, to which the temple belonged to. What a great sacrifice. Imagine Tirupati which is one of the richest temples in the world where which can boast of the maximum number of pil pilgrims visiting them then and even now. And with all the clout and influence the temple had, Shivyasaraja just gave it up at because that is not what he was supposed to do. He had other goals to pursue and the puja of that place as desired by Sri Venkateshwara himself was to be performed by the people uh, belonging to that family. So he handed back the temple. On the last day that he performed the puja which happened to be a Dwadashi on the 12th day of the fortnight, he fell at the feet of Sri Venkateshwara and what was to happen? Something magical happened at that moment. The Uttariya or the Vastra or the cloth which was put to Lord Venkateshwara just fell on Sri Vyasaraja as a big blessing that none other than Sri Venkateshwara himself had given Sri Vyasaraja. So absolutely enthralled and thrilled by this experience, Sri Vyasaraja then went to Vijayanagara Samrajya Hampi uh, on the invitation of Sri Krishnadevaraya. The Krishnadevaraya was one of the greatest kings of one possibly one of the most prosperous kingdoms that India ever saw. There was a time when people who visited that particular kingdom would talk about the fact that precious stones were all sold on the streets of Hampi. Not only that, the, the, the people who ran the administration had found a way by which the, the whole town and the whole kingdom would be lit with bright lights throughout the day of course and throughout the night. So, so much so that even in the night it appeared as though there was sunlight everywhere. A great achievement, a great scientific achievement of those days. And the kingdom knew just no bounds in terms of how comfortable and how prosperous people there were. So, Sri Vyasaraja entered Hampi and was soon ordained as the Rajaguru of, of the temple, of the, of the kingdom, which meant that he would be guiding Sri Krishna Devaraya through on all administrative matters and all spiritual and philosophical aspects as well. So once Sri you know, Krishna Devaraya was walking along the palanquin, which was carrying Sri Vyasaraja from one place to the other, and there was a massive ceremony which was planned at the end of that journey. Imagine the king, the emperor, walking next to the palanquin of Sri Vyasaraja. Curious about what Sri Vyasaraja was actually doing inside, he just moved the curtain of the palanquin a little bit to see what was happening inside. And to his shock, what did he see? That Vyasaraja was reading the Sarvamula Granthas of Sri Madhvacharya. Imagine. Two things stand out in the story that somebody was studying Sarvamula Granthas when he was already a very, very well established scholar. And not only that, he was, he was at the time when there was a big pomp and show happening outside. Most people would have looked outside the window see, to see what was happening there. But Shivyasa Raja just knew in his life what he had to be focusing on. So, she the, the king then asked him that, do you know what is the grandeur outside, O Guru? To which Sri Vasaraja responded by saying, O King, you don't know what is the grandeur inside when I am reading the Sarvamula Granthas. The spiritual lessons are so great that nothing can match the happiness level that one gets out of reading spiritual texts. Great lesson for Sri Krishna Devaraya as well. But again, it, this was not the end of the association. This association between both of them went on for many years. But one day, something terrible happened. Sri Krishna Devaraya came running to Vyasaraja with absolutely terrified and very dejected. Sri Vyasaraja asked him, what happened to you and why are you looking so mournful? 
he said look some of the astrologers have told me that I have Kuhaka Yoga that in that particular fortnight which meant that I will be attacked by a demon and the demon will kill me. An evil spirit will kill me. So Vyasaraja said not to worry. What this basically says is that the evil spirit will come and kill somebody who is sitting on the throne. So if other than you somebody else will be sitting on the throne then probably nothing would happen. And Sri Vyasaraja said not to worry O king you make me the emperor for one day. I will sit on the throne and the and you will be left unharmed. Sri Krishna Devaraya said absolutely impossible. I will not sacrifice you just to save my life. Your, your life probably is much much more um, precious to the to the generation then and to the generation after this. So I will not give up on you. So Sri Vyasaraja said, King, I don't think you heard what I said. What I, I said was, I will sit on the throne. I didn't say I will die. So don't worry. I have got enough spiritual power and God has been kind to bestow me with that power by which nothing will happen to me even if I sit on the throne on that day. Sri Krishna Devaraya a bit reluctantly agreed and handed over the kingdom to Sri Vyasaraja. Sri Vyasaraja sat on the throne at that moment and was waiting for the evil spirit to come, which he did promptly and tried to kill Vyasaraja. But Vyasaraja with his divine and mystical powers overcome the, overcame that comprehensively and not only survived but also killed the evil spirit and saved the life of Sri Krishna Devaraya. Shri Krishna, what can Sri Krishna Devaraya give back in return to someone who actually saved his life? He would have been a dead man but Sri Vyasaraja saves his life. And there is another startling incident that happened between the two of them. So one day Sri Vyasaraja was actually teaching his disciples and Sri Krishna Devaraya came running to him with a bit of panic on his face. Again he sought permission to meet Sri Vyasaraja and his disciple told him that he is actually teaching them and he is very busy. But Krishna Devaraya insisted that this matter is rather urgent. So immediately Sri Vyasaraja realized that Krishna Devaraya must have something truly urgent. So he allowed him to come and meet him. And Sri Krishna Devaraya then put in front of him a letter. The letter had been written by a group of scholars on Nyaya Shastra and had challenged Sri Krishna Devaraya saying, is there somebody in your kingdom which you call very prosperous who can give an answer to the questions that we have raised on Nyaya Shastra? If you have someone, please ask them to respond to these queries. If you don't, then we will assume that there is nobody in your kingdom who is learned enough or who has the scholastic ability to counter these arguments. So Sri Krishna Devaraya requested Sri Vyasaraja saying, can you please help me with this scenario. Sri Vyasaraja looked at the text, immediately called him, called his disciple and say, take down the answers. Krishna Devaraja was shocked. He said, I thought you will take a few days to respond. He said, no, these questions are very simple to answer. The answers to all of what these are have been asked are there in the Sarvamula Grantha of Sri Madhvacharya and all of the texts that Sri Jaitirtha himself has written. So look, referring to those texts, he very quickly and very spontaneously responded to all the questions and ensure that no doubts remain. And immediately Krishna Devaraya sent back the response to the people who had raised the query. Imagine the committee of scholars who were challenging none other than the emperor. What must have they felt when they got the response? They would have been shocked and of course amazed to see Sri Vyasaraja's tremendous scholarship, spontaneous response as well as in-depth knowledge that he had on the spiritual and philosophical topics. So this was how he countered that and soon after that Sri Krishna Devaraja made a request to Sri Vyasaraja saying, O Vyasaraja, you need to start a university which will house 
and which will be a great center of learning. So Sri Vyasaraja founded what is called the Vishwa Pavana Matha, a fantastic school which had 10,000 students who not only studied there but were also residing there. So what we call as the residential schools of today. Sri, Ma Sri Vyasaraja had founded it and do you know when this was done? It was 100 years before the Harvard University was founded in the United States. So imagine a multidisciplinary university was founded in the southern part of India for the first time which had 10,000 students studying different aspects of philosophy, science, spiritual studies, music, culture, etc. All of them, the Vishwapavana Matha by the way has in a re recent archaeological survey also has been dug up and the Matha, the Vishwapavana Matha exists even today. So that was the close association between Sri Krishna Devaraya and Sri Vyasaraja. Another incident happened when Sri Vyasaraja was at Hampi. Once he was performing the puja and he asked his disciples to actually go and fetch the tulsi leaves, the sacred leaves which are used at the time of the puja. The students went and they saw a large field full of tulsi tree plants and immediately plucked those leaves and brought it to Sri Vyasaraja. The Vyasaraja looked at that those tulsi leaves and said, Oh my God, this has already been offered to the God by someone. And the students were take, completely taken aback because they were leaves that they had just plucked and nobody had offered. He said, No, somebody has offered it. Go and find out. And immediately they went on, on a search and found that she Surendra Tirtha, again a person of immense scholastic abilities, a great saint, had actually indeed passed by those fields and was so overwhelmed to see the, the fields full of sacred leaves that mentally he said, I offer all these plants and these leaves at the feet of Sri Hari. Just that mental dedication was done and Sri Vyasaraja with his tremendous spiritual abilities was able to gauge that. So Sri Surendra Tirtha was invited by Sri Vyasaraja to come inside the kingdom and stay with him uh, with along with him in the Hampi city. And Sri Vyasaraja had many many students. One of the students was his name was Vishnu Tirtha. Now this Vishnu Tirtha is different from Sri Madhvacharya's brother, uh, Purvashama brother Vishnu Tirtha. This person is different. Again a person of enormous scholarship, someone who had a tremendously healthy and great spiritual lifestyle and someone whom Vyasaraja had been grooming for many years to become a great scholar in the future. And it is said that he had studied the Sarvamula Grantha and Srimanyaya Sutta several times, nine and six times respectively under the tutelage of Sri Vyasaraja. So you can imagine the depth that Sri Vishnu Tirtha had. So one day early in the morning, Surendra Tirtha was about to take his meal and suddenly became sullen. Sri Vyasaraja asked him, what happened? He said, I will not eat the food today and I will not even accept the Tirtha or the sacred water. And Sri Vyasaraja asked, what happened? Why are you upset? He said, I'm, I'm upset because I come from the southern part of India in what is modern day Tamil Nadu. And what we have seen that other forms of philosophy are misguiding people in that particular that part of the world and we need somebody strong to talk about the alternative perspective or Dvaita philosophy. And for that I request you to depute your disciple Sri Vishnu Tirtha to come along with me and join our Matha or his Matha. Immediately Vyasaraja without even batting an eyelid accepted it and said yes Sri Vishnu Tirtha will be your disciple going forward. He will propagate the Madhva philosophy as per your instruction. He did not think even for a second. Imagine the level of sacrifice. Someone whom he had groomed for many many years since his childhood to be one of the greatest scholars of our times. Sri Surendra Tirtha was delighted that he had indeed found a fantastic successor, 
a scholar of unparalleled brilliance and as as is the norm changed his name from Sri Vishnu Tirtha to be called as none other than Sri Vijayindra Tirtha whom we all know very fondly his Vrindavanam exists in the city of Kumbakonam even today Sri Vijayindra Tirtha's disciple was Sudhindra Tirtha whose disciple is the world famous Sri Raghavendra Swamiji himself. So this is the lineage that, that prospered for many many more centuries to come and that is a great story of sacrifice by Sri Vyasa Raja. Overall when we look at the life of Sri Vyasa Raja, what do we see? A person who was a very very unique culmination of great scholarship of very in-depth knowledge, someone with tremendous abilities to run, run, establish and run great institutions, a visionary unparalleled, an author unparalleled, a poet unparalleled and a human being who could guide millions of people several centuries after he entered the Vrindavana. He has made very unique contributions of not only propagating the Vyasa Sahitya or the Sahitya or, this, or the, the works which are there in, uh, in Sanskrit but also has composed a number of Kannada Devarnama or songs in Kannada which ensured that this, these rather difficult and abstract concepts that are expressed in Kannada, are expressed in Sanskrit also reach people who are, who cannot understand the language. I know I can understand the local language at that time which was Kannada. So that was a great contribution of Sri Vyasa Raja to the world, to, to the philosophical world. He wrote many texts, great texts and the Vyasa Trayas, the three great Khandana Grantha and Vada Granthas that he propounded stand out for the scholastic abilities and scholarly qualities even today. He had many, many disciples. It is said that he had more than 28 sannyasi shishyas. That means people who were saints and monks were already his shishyas. But apart from these, there were two stalwarts whom we will, who can, we can never forget. One was Sri Purandara Dasa, the Sangeeta Pitamaha as he is called. And Sri Kanaka Dasa, again who was a spiritual luminary of his times. Both of them, imagine, were contemporaries. So if you just look back, the scenario at that point in time, it was indeed a golden era for the Dvaita philosophy world, where Sri Vyasa Raja, Sri Vijayendra Tirtha, as we have seen, Sri Vadi Rajaru, who was also a disciple of Sri Vyasa Raja, Purandara Dasa and Kanaka Dasa, along with several other very, very illustrious people, were contemporaries. So you can imagine what, what the, the difference that one person, one great scholar like Vyasaraja can do to, the, to raising the scholastic levels at that point in time. It is said that the greatest test of scholarship for anyone was to get a little bit of appreciation from Sri Vyasaraja. The Vyasa Yogi Charita actually says that if somebody came and presented a scholarly work and in front of Sri Vyasa Raja and Sri Vyasa Raja would just move his head a little bit, shake his head in appreciation or even an acceptance or even not objecting to it, the person, the scholar who would have composed that work would actually go mad because unable to contain his excitement. Now that is a very nice way of saying how great a scholar that Sri Vyasa Raja himself was. He lived the years as a the world in this world for 92 very long years again a Dirgha Ayusha. Now many people might live for many years but look at the quality of the life that he had, the contribution that he made to Dvaita philosophy and ensured that the great work which got started Madhvacharya and his contemporary disciples and subsequently by Jai Tirtha, Sri Sripada Raja and Brahmana Tirtha and many other illustrious saints and scholars continues for, for many many centuries. It is hard for us to imagine that one person could have achieved so much. Not only this, 
as a symbol of the Dvaita philosophy and its omnipresence, Sri Vyasa Raja has established hundreds of Sri Hanuman's idols all over the southern part of India. So it is very, very distinguishable about the, the one that he has established versus done, that done by others. It is characterized by turning to one side. The idol is always turned to one side. However, both the eyes would be visible. The, the tail, the end of the tail will have a, a bell, a ghante or at the end of it, the typically the, uh, the right hand will have, uh, will have the saugandika pushpa or the divine flower and his left hand would be raised like this which is a clear symbol of abhaya hasta or something which gives us confidence saying that I am there to protect you. So he has established as I said hundreds of these uh, idols, they are spread over different parts of, of southern India and even today are sought after by many people. Of course, the one at uh, Yantrodharaka Pranadevaru, which is there in Hampi, stands as a great symbol of his absolute dedication to the Madhvamata and something where people visit even to this day to pray and get all their sorrows removed and get all the happiness that they can. So, Sri Vyasaraja entered the Vrindavanam in the famous Nava Vrindavana. Nava Vrindavana is again about 40 kilometers of the city of Ampi. It is a small town and the Nava Vrindavanas, the nine Vrindavanas of nine great saints are in, the, in a small island on the banks of river Krishna. So those of you who visited will agree with me that it is absolutely celestial experience one gets when he visits that place and very very distinguished amongst those Nava Vrindavanas or the nine Vrindavanas is the Vrindavana of Sri Vyasaraja. Having been, having had so many people from the royal family as his disciples, they have ensured that it is carved beautifully. It stands out for his, for the cultural work that has happened on the, on the Vrindavana itself. And it stands tall as a symbol of someone who's, who, who represents scholarship at the highest level, a person who was very keen or uh, ensured and is kind enough to connect to the common man as he did to an emperor and was a Vidya Guru to great great scholars, a Raja Guru to Sri Krishna Devaraya and someone who was who had performed the puja of Sri Venkatesha. As many people say that many centuries from now or maybe even decades, we might even wonder that if, whether it was one Vyasa Raja or one Vyasa Tirtha or were there so many people. Why do we get that feeling probably is because it is very hard to imagine how one person could have made such a stellar contribution in virtually every aspect of his life. So Vyasa Raja's legacy continued and continues to this, this day when people of his lineage have ensured that the Dvaita philosophy gets propagated actively. The very fact that we are all sitting here today and thinking about someone who was in the 14th century talks about his enormous impact on not just the people who were his contemporaries but people who were there several centuries after that. So that is the life and works of Sri Vyasarajan, one of the greatest saints that we have known. Let us dedicate our life going forward to reading at least one Devarnama, reading one song, reading one text, learning one shloka on him or the one that has been composed by him and that will be the true Aradhana of Sri Vyasaraja. Unfortunately, it has become a norm that whenever we think about Aradhana, it is about the food, it is about how many you know, sweets were actually served and you know how many people gathered and so on and so forth. Yes, those are very, very important aspects. That is a great way of celebrating the life of a great teacher. But for a true guru, the only thing a true guru or a true teacher asks 
and wants is that his disciple learns the Madhva Shastra, learns the spiritual text and emerges stronger as an individual and becomes an asset to his society, to, to mankind as a whole. So if, if there is a student you know, who goes and wishes his teacher on her birthday, a good teacher would always say thank you but immediately follow up with the question, have you done your homework or not? Because the teacher is more concerned about the student's ability to learn and his dedication and would be very, very anxious to ensure that that happens. Nothing else pleases her more than his, her student actually having learnt his lessons. So in this year, let us celebrate Sri Asaraja Aradhana in a very different way. Of course, we will have a feast and there will be great uh, sweets served. We will all meet and enjoy that moment. But at that time, let us make an attempt to understand the Madhva Tattva, Madhva Shastra that Sri Vyasaraja himself propounded and make a small attempt, however difficult it might appear, to study some or all of his texts. So I once again thank the Munitraya organization uh, led by a very, very illustrious leaders to give, have given me an opportunity to share nuggets of Sri Vyasaraja's life. To be honest, I am too small a person to talk about Sri Vyasaraja, but I did not want to let go of an opportunity to share whatever little I have learnt from my gurus and be able to present it. Please forgive me if there is there are any mistakes or errors in the way I have spoken about Sri Vyasaraja. Those mistakes are entirely mine. Thank you once again and wish all of you a very happy and a prosperous lifestyle. Namaskar.